e aki ana te atakura he teo he huka he hohu tihe moriora. So welcome everybody. Um, we are recording the session today just to let you know and it will be up on the Leanza YouTube uh, later for people who may not be able to attend at this time. Um, if you have any questions as we're going through today, we really invite you to put them into the chat. I will, I will be monitoring the chat and so will Angie Kencross, who is the Leanza Communications Advisor. So that would be really helpful for us. And so without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you coming from somewhere in the United States, I think California, is um, Daniel Miller. And he's here to talk to us about the collection and uh, give you some advice on why it's there, what it's there to do, and how you might be able to access some of these images for your collections. So um, thank you so much, Daniel, for joining us, and I will hand over to you. Right. Well, listen, thank you for having me. And uh, if you all wonder why I'm dressed the way I'm dressed in the middle of your summer, I'm sitting in a warehouse that's, uh, I think, eight and a half degrees Celsius right now. So uh, when I'm moving, it, everything is fine. But when any of us sit, we're, uh, we're, we're at the discretion uh, of the photographs. The photographs like it's super cold and they don't like any humidity. So um, here, here we are trying to uh, do the best we can with this work. So I hope many of you had a chance to read through the <coughs> website we put up and to have an idea about what the story is behind this archive. I can tell you that if you would have asked me four or five years ago, if, we, if I'd be sitting here talking about this now, I would have said you're crazy because um, this sort of became a project for us at the very end of this archive. Uh, if you know the whole story, the archive was sent to the US to be digitized in a very dumb move. And when that was done, the company was raided by the FBI, the US FBI shortly after that. The company went bankrupt. The photographs were seized by a bank that was owed a lot of money. And basically the bank wanted to sell these photographs off or just to destroy them because it, had they destroyed them, they could have taken them off their balance sheet. And it probably would have, they were probably weighing it equally, destroying or selling them. I think if they destroyed them, they actually would have made a bigger tax credit than actually selling them. So I, I was, kind of the last man standing when I heard about it. And I, I intervened and I said, that's really a bad idea. These two archives, it was Sydney Archives, Sydney Morning Herald, and six different, seven different newspapers across New Zealand. I said, these represent countries' histories. These aren't just random newspapers. These, this represents a really important swath of history. So uh, I, the bank was somewhat unimpressed. And basically they had a number that they had in mind. I, I think they were owed 14 million US on the archive and they wanted a pretty significant percentage of that. And I wanted to pay a lot less, but we ended up with a deal. And I thought that we would just be able to turn this material directly over to one library in, in Australia and one library in New Zealand. And we'd just be the bridge keeping it together. And I realized with 4 million objects, which is 47 tons of paper, that's a little complicated. So we've been trying to be responsible, breaking this archive into sections and getting it to the best possible caretakers. So many different, I, we started in Australia and I think now the collection's in 72 different public institutions across Australia. So I'm very happy about that. Many have come back for second and third pieces of the archive. So all the prominent museums and libraries in Australia pretty much are in a bunch of small, tiny museums. We've been helping the libraries as well. So our success has been fantastic there and the media has borne it out. So now here we are in New Zealand and I'm trying to do the same thing, trying to figure it out. In Australia, we used public auctions to help us subsidize the costs for institutions. So you'll see that here, we were using a company called Webs in Auckland for auctions over the past couple of years. I think we ran 15 different auctions with them. And that helped fund some of our, our efforts to keep the facility running here. First of all, it's quite expensive. This is a standalone warehouse with humidity and climate control, a, a brand new roof. Um, it's, it goes, <laughs> the expenses are kind of crazy. So 
basically that's, so our idea is to continue to do public auctions of, of a fraction of the archive, but also to find institutions that sections of this fit in well. And we've had some success with this already, and we wanted to accelerate that success. So basically each of you is responsible for your, I'm hoping is responsible for, or works with your section of heritage. And it's just a question of how can we help? What, how can we do this? When we first took the archive, there are seven different newspapers. And you know what? I can't remember all of them, sorry. But the standard big newspapers across all the Fairfax properties. So we had seven different sorts and every newspaper sorted it a little bit differently. It was impossible to find anything. So I made the executive decision to sort it all together. So basically, for example, Auckland, there were seven different historic folders of Auckland or areas of Auckland. We put them all together because it made sense. Uh, same thing all the way across the archive, whether it was politicians, there were several different folders of the same kind of politician uh, on and on. So basically the archive is much more sensible now and I found that even a newspaper in Wellington might have a really good section on Auckland, occasionally a better section on Auckland than a newspaper in Christchurch might. So we found out all kinds of really interesting stuff like that. And that's how we've organized it. So basically by subject matter and by uh, personality matter is how this archive is organized now. So it's about half subject and about half personality. So the personalities are race car drivers or politicians or authors and poets or business people. The areas are very specific, the geographic areas are real specific. So that's more or less 500 or so towns across the country. So, I mean, basically that's, that's, that's our idea. So our idea is to reach out to you folks and, and um, be able to supply material uh, cost effectively for your budget. We did have to buy the whole archive. So we would ask that you understand that we have to sell it, we can't give it to you. So, but the idea of us having some public auctions hopefully should offset some costs to you. We, we are working with a couple of valuers. So section by section, we'll have good valuations you're able to bring to your management, your library. So um, I think that should be super helpful. So we'll be supplying that. Now I know that some of you have to go out and get your own valuations as well, fully understood, but at least you'll have an idea of the process and how we're doing it. So hopefully that that helps. Um, that That's like, a lot of really what I want to present kind of about what we had, just that our objective is to get every single photo back to New Zealand. There is no reason for us to have any of this material in the US. This is crazy to have it here. So we're just trying to do this responsibly. Just know this is a very difficult mission for us. I really had no idea it was going to be this difficult. Now, if anybody has a rich uncle that wants to stand up, to buy the whole thing. I, I will absolutely buy you coffee for a year, every day, maybe twice. But but um, but short of that, I mean, we're just trying to do what we can do and all the help we can get from you folks would be great. Mostly pronunciations of names because that's a real problem for me. And for some of our people in spelling in general, that's a, a bit difficult, but we're working on it. So there's that. So I, I'm hoping maybe there's some questions that have, that have popped up that uh, that you folks can start asking and I can start replying to and we can keep this thing rolling. Anything, uh, anything that's, uh, that's come to come to light that's interesting? Um, I will invite everybody to put any questions into the chat, but I would <clears throat> kick off. I had a really um, basic kind of question was around if a library Bid for bids for and and gains a photo or photographs or whatever. Do they get the original physical copy of it? Do they get a digitized copy of it? How does how does the artifact actually uh, arrive in the library's collection? Super fair question. Um, the actual physical photographs are what we're selling. So we don't own and we don't control copyright to any of these photographs. It's a completely separate discussion. 
I've had discussions with Fairfax uh, and Fairfax's legal team in Australia about it, which was arguably one of the holders of the copyright over the whole collection. They believe that most of what we have is out of copyright. So they believe that most of what we have has no copyright issues. We've had no conflicts with them at all, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, with stuff in New Zealand, I have a meeting with them tomorrow. And one of the things I wanna to talk to them about to make sure that these photographs have the best possible ability for library usage. With that said, if any of your libraries wanna produce a revenue making product, like make a book and sell it or make a poster and sell it, that's a different, that's a whole different topic. That means probably there could be some copyright issues along the way. I think for standard library usage, I think by and large, there really won't be many problems. I, I don't imagine that, but it is the actual physical piece. These were, these were all digitized very quickly in, uh, gosh, I don't know, four or five, six years ago, I think. The, the digital files that you may see or hear about are virtually unusable. I think they were 150 DPI and they were done from document scanners, not photo scanners. They were done very quickly and they were done from very uncleaned photographs. So the actual physical objects of the, of the scan, it's pretty bad. So pretty much for any of your usage, you're gonna to wanna to rescan them. We're starting to do some of our own digitizing. We might be able to help. I sure prefer not to. I sure prefer if your institutions can, but you know, I understand you've all got a lot of work to do already. And here I am, I'm the American guy to give you more work to do. <laughs> so I'm try I would like to not give you more work to do, but we, have, we do have the ability to do some digitizing it's conceivable, you know, to talk to me about it one section at a time. So, so the, there is one question there from Andy um, Fenton from NZMS. Are they just prints or negatives and prints? Ah, right. We have some negatives, but these are primarily prints. The whole Fairfax journey has been very strange. As far as I can tell, most of the negatives are, are degraded beyond use or just lost. And to try to tie a negative to a photo any longer is kind of impossible. I'd say it's probably fully impossible because there was never a time where a negative was clearly labeled to an actual print. So we are only really involved with photographs, not, not negatives. Now, another important part, these are the original photographs that these newspapers were made from. So from about 1910 forward, these photographs were all the piece that was used to shoot a half tone to make the newspaper. Now, some of these photos, many of them are classic vintage photographs, meaning they were printed within six months of when they were taken, which is a classic term for a quote vintage photograph. So if it's a 1922 photograph shot then, it was printed in 1922. Many of these are, some of these are not. Some of these photographs were reproductions that came from I, I believe the Turnbull Library, there are some, and probably in the hundreds, that somehow were supplied to Fairfax back maybe in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Some are just prints that were made later in some way. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a variety of actual objects, but the fact is these are clearly the original photographs that the newspaper used. We have not reproduced anything. We have not sold anything to be reproduced. We don't even have the capacity to do that. It's not our, that's not our interest. More questions, please. So there was a question, um, are there any specifics on rights management? Uh, if I was an attorney in New Zealand, I could advise you, but because um, I'm not, or a solicitor, I, I, I cannot. So I think my understanding is mostly from Australian law, which is a, a bit different, I do believe, than New Zealand copyright law, that primarily for library usage, you're pretty in the clear. And this is what Fairfax themselves before Nine bought them told me. And in fact, that is what Nine told me as well. So I don't have an answer to that. I think in, a, in Australia, any photograph taken before 1955 is fair usage. 
I'm not super clear if it's the photographer's life plus 60 or 70 years there. I think it's, I'm sure one of you knows. You probably all know that. Man. But no, we don't. We're just selling a physical piece of paper. We're not selling any rights. We're not offering any right sales. It's just the actual physical print. Oh, thank you. Uh, another question is, is there any subject analysis, e.g. sport, art, farming, etc.? Yes, it took us about a year and a half to do that. Uh, so when this archive came, it was one photo at a time that got sorted. So if you can imagine uh, two and a half people that I hired, uh, <laughs> the difference between rugby union and rugby league was a, was a big consternation. Um, the idea of what football actually represents was a, was a problem for Americans. So, so on and on, we had difficulties really establishing that. So we made a, a bunch of different topics. I think just 500 or so different topics and all in the archive. So there, there are provisions. Yes, it's, um, there, are, there are some topics. And I, was, I suppose that any of you could, uh, I'm gonna be asking for trouble. I, I suppose you could email me and I think we can send a PDF out so our best email is info at the fairfaxarchives.co.nz and you can find that i would suggest you all probably to register to the auction site we have so you can get the best news it doesn't it doesn't uh, mean you have to do anything but just registering just registration alone means that you'll get all the news ahead of time for auctions we do i know that in the last couple of auctions we've done oh. i think five different museums have bought pieces of it. So I know that that's going to be a popular way to do this, like piece by piece. Um, we're trying to get way out ahead so you can have 60, 60 days notice for an auction to come up. Because I know to get this thing through management, you know, when you have to go a few tiers up to get a budget to be able to buy stuff, I know it's complicated. So we're trying to do it on a, we're, we're really making an effort to do this far. And I can tell you right now, we have a historic Wellington auction Wellington auction. It's pretty fantastic and it's going to open in, I don't know, six or seven days, I think. So there you have six days. <laughs> Sorry, not a lot. We're working on it. Another question is how many of the images are duplicated or are they all unique? That's a great, wow, these are good questions. Um, we find very few duplicates in the archive. And this really surprised me because like I said, we combined these newspapers together. So I expected we're gonna find a ton of stuff. My guess is less than 10% of the archive is duplicated and it could be closer to 5% or so. We don't have an exact count on that, but I can tell you, uh, we rarely do we find the same image. So I would say that's really not, not an issue. It hasn't been an issue. One thing I can tell you is because of the damage that happened on the archive, oh, I wish I had some damage prints to hold up. Basically it was moisture because these were stored very poorly with, with, without moisture control for a while. The boxes are on the edges of the storage, got some moisture in them. The backs of some photos stuck to the fronts of other photos because of the moisture. And, and because improper tape was used on the back of some of these things too. So that caused some problems. And usually it's, like I said, it's about 10% of the archive. Our historical policy has been to give those photos for free along with whatever an institution buys. So if an institution buys 100 photos and there's an extra 10 that are damaged, especially significant damage, we just give those to you because it seems fair. I mean, it's still an object that's important, has important value for you because typically these have lots of material written on the back. I wonder if I can find a photo from where I'm sitting. It's got something written on the back of it. I wasn't prepared for show and tell. Probably not. I'm going to just be an idiot right now. Uh, I really can't. But I was trying. Oh, here's one. Okay. So here's a photograph of <laughs> reading the back. The uh, Unisys building in Wellington. Um, and you can see because it's on the back. So there's what we call metadata on the back of many of these photos that can help fix, sort out what they are within the folders. Maybe that's helpful. Did I completely lose track of the question? Was I okay? No, that's cool. 
Um, another question somebody's asking is, um, do the lists for each publication show the date ranges involved? Uh, no. The lists that we have don't because they can't. Um, but I can tell you they are kind of in general. The earliest photograph I think we found was 1847 or 1848. And that, that was an album in print mounted to board of which we have some. Um, they're not in great condition, typically these older ones. I would say that the bulk of the archive begins about 1920. And it works like this. I, I don't know how many of you know newspaper archives, but newspapers in the 1920s just began really using photographs. But in the 1930s, they used more photographs. The 1940s, the war happened and photographs slowed down in general. Uh, at the late 1940s, photographs became a huge part of most newspapers. And the reason was newspapers were really booming after the war and they recognized that photographs were a great way to make the paper larger and thicker without spending a lot of money because they could buy a photograph pretty inexpensively and they could make it really big. So when, when the history of photographic use in newspapers really started to flourish in the late 1940s, and that's across the world, but by the 1950s, photographs really were prominent in newspapers for this particular reason. So a lot of the archive is weighted from the 1950s to the 1990s, I would say. The 1940s, this represents in general for newspaper photographs, there's a shortage because photographers were at war. There was just a lot of war. There were issues. The 1930s are a pretty fertile area for this particular archive. I noticed in Wellington, I think the historic Wellington material that we saw, roughly 25% of it was in the 1930s, which really surprised me, probably more than the 1990s. And some really beautiful, the older princess had a beautiful silver gelatin coating. Um, as, as prints progressed over the years, I think in the 1970s, Kodak, which made a lot of the chemicals in the paper for these prints, got some mandates in the US government to put less silver in them because it was a bad thing for the environment. So from that, they thinned the silver out a little bit in photographs after 1970, these kinds of commercial photographs typically aren't as beautiful. So there you go, a little tidbit. I'm, I'm sure there's got, oh, look, how, look how many chat things there are. There's like a bazillion, okay. <laughs> More questions, please. So the next question is, have there been any issues related to images of people, cultural or practical? Uh, well, I, I went on your national media and made what I hope is a mandate for us to supply the Maori section to one institution. And we've had talks with a couple institutions, and I'm really hoping it's going to go to the best one, because I think that's super important for us. Now, that said, had we chose just to sell it in little pieces, we, we would make an extraordinary amount of money. But I think that's really a bad thing to do. And I, and I, thought, I thought it from the very beginning. In, in Australia, we did the same thing. We supplied the entire Aboriginal archive that we had to the National um, Library in Canberra. So I just think that's super important. So I think, and I don't know, I mean, I had an idea about Aboriginal people Native people in Australia's photo usage of dead people was a big problem. I don't know what the Maori story is about that. And honestly speaking, I hope I don't have to know because I'm hoping we can just supply it all to one great institution. So in terms of a person's right of privacy being photographed by a newspaper photogra photographer, I, I don't think anybody can sue us because first of all, we're in the US and second of all, you know, we didn't take the photo. I don't, that's a, that's a good question for, a, for an attorney, but I haven't heard of this. I mean, I think I've heard of one or two cases in New York ever. And if this were to happen, it would happen in New York. So, I mean, if you wanna dial in on that question for me, but I think in general for, for if a person's being photographed by a news photographer, I think it's too late. I think the photo's already out there. Okay, thank you. Another question has come in, and uh, so just bear with me here. 
due to the nature of the collection, duplicates and copy prints, it sounds like the rights research sits with the person or organization purchasing the item. Would that be correct? For example, if we purchased an image and wanted to include it in an exhibition, we would complete the necessary due diligence. Uh, that, that is 100% correct. Now, this archive is strange. The, our archive in Sydney had a lot of metadata on the backs of photographs. For some reason, um, New Zealanders didn't do that as much. So there are a good percentage of these photographs that we call orphan photographs. We don't have information on them. There's no information on the back of it. Certainly there isn't any copyright information. Um, the photograph that I just held up a second ago. Oh, yeah, here we go, right? So here's a photograph that's a good idea about this, whoops. And on that photograph, it has a date of November 20th, 1987. It has what it is. And it says Buildings Wellington, and that's it. It has no copyright holder, no photographer name, no stamp from a publication, nada. So I don't know how you deal with that in New Zealand. That's a tough one. Some of these, some of them are like that, but I suspect that in any of your collections, you'd had to deal with things like this previously. So I, I don't know in terms of that 1987 photo, if without notice on the, in the US without notice on the back of it, in the United States law, it's different than your you know, post Commonwealth law there. It would be really hard for someone to sue against it just out of good faith. If you take a look and try to find it, I think that's probably good, but I, I'm sure there's at least one lawyer out there. We've got a lot of people here. So um, maybe somebody can comment on that. Maybe somebody knows, I'm sure somebody knows more than I do. So there's that. More questions. I don't have any more questions in the chat at the moment, unless anybody has something that they are dying to ask. So you've got several, uh, oh no, here's one, but I was just going to ask a question of my own. So you've got several options coming up around sort of specific topics. Are you intending that you'll keep doing that sort of going forward um, into 2023? Yes, I think, uh, you know, we had, Webs was our auction partner for some time, and I think they really wanted to pursue higher end sales than photographs like the Bank of New Zealand's collection, things like this. So we were, we were kind of forced into opening our own auction house. We really didn't want to do it, but to really represent this material the best, it was it was a good idea. So our auction house just opened last month and we just, we're in the middle of our third auction, which by the way, is a really good auction on Gene Batten. Mm -hmm. So Gene was the record aviator, the most famous aviator across New Zealand. And the story of her life is pretty remarkable. And, uh, the photographs we have here of her primarily are vintage taken when they were printed when they were taken. Um, we'll have a combination, I believe, of areas and people and things and ideas. So one auction that we'll have will be like uh, poets, essayists, and novelists. So basically the writers of New Zealand, because I think that's going to be very interesting. We'll do one likely on musicians because I think that'll be very interesting too. We'll do different sections. In Wellington, we have a historical auction. I think I mentioned this coming up in about a week. And it's a beautiful selection of photographs. We've chosen to take about 10 from every decade from the beginning of the 20th century to, to the end. So it's going to be a, a very interesting auction with some buildings that you'll be seeing across six or seven years. Um, yeah, there'll be a, there'll be, our idea is likely to do about two a month. So I've taken some queries from libraries that say, oh no, well, that's the section we wanted and you're going to auction it and no. Okay, so typically any section of these have a few thousand photographs in them and our typical auction is about 75 photographs. And they're not necessarily the most important photographs. They're the ones that we think we can find buyers for. So in general, I wouldn't work with them. Sorry, everybody, that's me. 
not anymore. Uh, so uh, I did the bad rule, did it myself. Um, yes, so yes, so my guesses will probably be doing about two a month. We may do more. We may do some photos of very strange and obscure topics that would be bundles. So there might be some lots that may control, uh, shoot, uh, you might buy a hundred photographs in one set. That's, that's, that's possible coming up. But what I'm really hoping is that, again, you libraries come to us with specific ideas. So a few libraries have come to us and they'll say, you know, we'd like photographs in the region of la la la. Remember, I'm not a Kiwi. So it would be in like naming a bunch of little towns or naming people or naming industries or naming very particular areas that hopefully we can find. That's challenging for sure, of course. So, but that would be to find what you're looking for. That's the best way to do it. Okay, I think I answered that. I think you may already have answered this question, but just to clarify, with your reorganization of the collections, have you kept the publication separate? For example, is the Manawatu Evening Standard separate from Wellington's Dominion Post uh, newspaper? Right. You know, we looked at that very hard because that was our original idea to do that. But then the problem was going to be each one of these papers had sections that duplicated. So it didn't make sense because then there'd be seven different sections of Wellington. There'd be seven different sections of animals in a zoo. There'd be seven sections of politicians. It, it, it didn't make any sense across the country. So what we did do was we extracted foreign stuff, which was a whole bunch of this work, and we put it together separate, a separate area. That's the Australian stuff, American, British stuff, a lot of British stuff that we pulled out. And we kept the, the, the New Zealand work together. So we no longer have that. Now that said, many of these photos when they were originally digitized, there were labels that were put on the backs that call out the actual original newspaper it came from. So it's conceivable that that can be found out within these sections. But the reason we, we didn't do that was because it's just, it was too much to manage having, we have 500 sections already. Multiplying that times seven is just really unrealistic to try to manage all that amount of stuff. I mean, you're all librarians. If any of you want to come here for a couple of years, I'm paying. <laughs> so uh, so uh, we actually could use a librarian here. If anybody wants to come to the U.S., they can figure it out. This is great. I get an ad right inside my talk. So uh, we, we, need, we, we need help of the New Zealand variety. So, uh, yeah, so I think I answered that. Thank yeah, you, you did. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions about what libraries can do so that they're not competing with each other as part of the web's auction? Is there another way they can come to you to purchase? Ah, right. Okay. So, so you know, moving forward, all the auctions are, are on our own site. So we won't be doing auctions with webs anymore or any other auction near in your country. It's all on the fairfaxarchives.co.nz. And I'm sure you can find that somewhere where you probably found it. Um, which gives a lot of information. I have seen, I have seen examples already of museums and libraries competing with each other on just the three auctions we've done. I don't know how to, I don't know how to undo that single photo wise. If you as a library see a, a section that we're, the best way is to get us before we actually auction something off, to come to us and say, do you have anything on blah, blah, blah. Um, we'd be more than happy to, to, to be able to send you a couple thousand photographs that encompass the entire topic of whatever it might be. We'd be very happy to do that. So I would say that's the best way. Second best way is to see something at an auction and then to be able to tell us after, well, what we really would like would be more material just like that. And I'm sure we have it because none of the auctions that we run can possibly list all of the material under any subject matter under any topic so but i don't know how to i mean just a just the nature of an auction is people compete with each other and please understand this auction revenue helps us keep the lights on keep the bills paid keep these things stored very nicely it's expensive in the summertime 
to keep this temperature down here. Really expensive. So, um, yeah, that's another one. Um, there was a question just a little bit back up here. You can all, nobody has to be shy. Everybody can ask questions. There are no dumb questions. I won't make fun of anybody today. I guess there's a there's a bit of comment going on in the chat about sort of how sad it is that the collection left New Zealand and now that New Zealand <laughs> institutions are having to buy it back, which I'm sure you have some quite strong feelings on as well. Well, okay, let's call it a silver lining because had the stuff never left New Zealand, you would have no capability to buy it. Okay, so let's just be straight out. It would have stayed someplace in some Fairfax drawer somewhere, probably decayed marvelously. And it would have been useless and like that. So the fact is that we had this exact thing that came up in Australia. And, and the fact is that this stuff would have just deteriorated beyond belief. And the average person could never have bought any of these pieces. So there's a silver lining to the story because this actually happened, yes, this is coming back. Okay, great. We had to buy it. And when we bought it, there was a public announcement. There was an announcement made in New Zealand. No, Kiwi stood up and said, hey, I, I'd like to put my money in to buy this thing. No, it was me, an American, that had to do it, and, and which is insane, right? I, I think it's a little crazy, but we had to do that. And then that wasn't the part, the part was buying a 500 meter warehouse to store the stuff in. There's a part about putting a new roof on it to make sure nothing leaked. There was a part about it to, to climatize control, it, which costs us about well, 45,000 US. So the, the other parts of actually maintaining this archive in a way that it can go on in the future, super, super expensive and super important. And it just wasn't being done now. Everybody can go back and say, yeah, never should have left. I agree. And look, we didn't, this wasn't our idea. <laughs> I ended up with this thing at kind of the last minute. What would have been worse? Us doing what we're doing now or the thing to be in a landfill? That's for you to answer because I'm telling you, it was, it was a close call. So I agree. It's, we're trying to make the best of a bad situation. That's a fact. But we had to buy it. So just remember, and it was very expensive. And we have owned most of this archive for between two and five years now. And we are not on the profit side yet, not close. So just know that. In Australia, I just asked, well, how come none of, nobody put up the money to do this? Why we had to do it? So the same thing. So I agree. I fully agree. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that your government allowed it to leave. It's ridiculous that nobody inside New Zealand, New Zealand could have digitized it. That's insane. We could have brought a crew and trained 10 people there to do this thing. It would have been knocked out in three or four months. Absolutely. It is crazy that they let this thing go. So, I mean, I have st strong ideas about it, but I don't want to make anybody angry i mean more than they are already well here's a really practical question we can return to then somebody <laughs> asks are you able to give us a rough idea of price for example per image or per collection hard with auctions i know but are we talking ten dollars or a thousand dollars um the answer is yes uh, <laughs> i mean uh what my objective is to be able to do on any particular collection let's say you want the history of, I'm looking at the wall. Let's say you want the history of Hutt Valley, okay, in Wellington. It is pronounced Hutt Valley, isn't it? Okay, good, because we've got a bunch of photos on it, two T's and Hutt. Uh, we count them, we figure out how many they are. Our process now is to be able to get it to a valuer to establish what the value should be in that particular section, rather than just make a number up. To, to, to be able to get a good solid valuation on it. From that valuation, our objective is to sell it to a library for a percentage of the valuation. There's no way we can sell it for a retail valuation to an institution, that's a bad idea. But it's gonna be a percentage of. So my guess is you're gonna be probably closer to the $10 area. 
some sections that may be more in demand could be a little bit more. Nothing will be a thousand dollars when we sell direct, not a single thing, that's impossible. So my, we're trying to keep this reasonable. So my idea is likely between probably 10 and $30 is probably kind of an kind of a idea. We have a section on the all blacks that I went to, I went to the all blacks from, and they seem to be having some troubles when we went to them. And there's 40,000 photographs. And it's the history of rugby in your country. It, it has immense value to someone, but not to them. So, you know, that's 40,000 photographs are going to sell by their photograph much less than 100 photographs that is going to take us a week to find. And the problem is a lot of this stuff, it's still analog. We have to find the material. So not only did we have to buy it, did we have to store it, did I have to hire two and a half people for three years to go through and sort it. But now we actually have to find it too when you want something unusual. So just know that this all costs money. None of this is, none of this is government sponsored. Your government, by the way, never reached out to us to say, hey, we'd like to help. We'd like to do a solid and help get this stuff back. We're gonna help, we're gonna figure it out. No, we didn't get any of that. So just so you know, it's good for you to know. Right? Okay, more questions, please. Ask the hard questions. <laughs> Fairfax could have given more of the, oh, I didn't see the rest of it, but it looked like it was a good one. Is that a good one? Uh, it's a comment saying Fairfax could have given more of the collection to Auckland Museum and then everyone would have access to it. I mean, I wow. guess there's a lot of could have, should have, Yes. Now, here's what's interesting. Before this collection left the country, a ton of work was, was stripped out of it, by the way, because when we bought the Australian collection, there were a lots of very famous photographers within that collection. Wolfgang Sievers, Max Dupin, Jeff Carter, David Moore, on and on, Olive Cotton. There were a bunch of really well-known photographers, prints in that collection. I assumed when we bought this collection, it was going to be the same. Somebody went through and grabbed all of it. I mean, there, we have a dozen prints of Hans Wester, for example. There would have been hundreds. On and on and on and on and on. Uh, a ton of stuff was taken out, and I believe donated to museums at that time. Our researchers did a little bit of work. We found the Fairfax, Fairfax prints are in many different New Zealand museums and libraries. So a lot of this work stayed over there. And I don't know if people just pilfered some of it and stole it. I, I don't really have any idea, but that's before it ever showed up in uh, in the facility in Arkansas where it was first went to, to be scanned because nobody there knew anything about photos. So they didn't steal anything like that. But, um, but, I'm, but for sure, my guess is probably about 20% was taken out of what was considered culturally sensitive or was taken out at that time. So, Great question though. Uh, so, but a lot of the work is. So, and should Fairfax have done more at that time? Yeah, you gotta, but you gotta remember. So Fairfax was like a wounded animal back then. And, and the I think the thickest Sydney Morning Herald, as I think in 1988 or 1989, I think the paper was like this thick on a Sunday paper, and they thought it was going to go on forever. They weren't really aware of this thing called the internet coming. And and, um, and every year after like 1989, the revenue went down, 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 until newspapers now are arguably relevant or not, we don't know. So um, they were looking in, in the end of the 2000s, they were kind of imploding, wanting to sell buildings, wanting to do anything that they could. So my understanding was in the meeting that they had, that they, the guy, the salesman that came to sell them on this digitizing thing was apparently a great salesman. And he said, okay, here's what's gonna happen. All those stinky old photos that you have no use for, that you don't even know what to do with, you're gonna put them in a container, you're gonna send them to our state of the art facility, we're gonna digitize them for you. Right after we digitize them, you can have a license in Mongetti and make immediate money. You're gonna be able to sack the three people that work in that, uh, in that photo warehouse right away. You're going to be able to sell the actual building. And, and Fairfax had a lot of real estate holdings 
in Sydney at the time. And they said, you gotta go sell the building those, those old photographs were in. And, and so all the heads were nodding around, around the conference table is my understanding. And they're like, this is great. We make money, we save money, we don't lose anything. We get rid of these dumb photographs. And um, that was, I believe, part of, part of the decision. Now, I hope I'm not offending anybody terrible that might have been part of the part of the conversation that's on this call now, but that's what I that's what I heard from a few different people, that that's how it went. So that's that's why you know it was a, it was a starving media company, and I don't think in the in 2013 to 2019 they were in any position to donate any of it. So, it, but it's a shame. I agree. Any um, follow. Yeah. There aren't any more particular questions here, but just some comments about some examples of where um, and Fairfax community newspapers did indeed donate uh, photo negatives to uh, library um, archives or city archives. So there are some examples of where that, that has happened. Um, well, there's a bunch, thousands. There are thousands. And mm -hmm. if you search library collections across New Zealand, you'll find thousands and thousands. That are like this. There's there are roughly uh, we lost we stopped counting when we got to 10 million similar photographs across institutions in New Zealand. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's similar to this in collections now. So I would I would say there are more photographs like this in New Zealand in public collections than there are in Australia. How crazy is that? It's probably true. I think it's true. So yeah, you can ask me hard questions or hard comments. If people are really angry at me, I, don't, I can take it. There, there is one Ooh. question that we might have missed, but it's not a hard question, Daniel. It's, um, does your headings list include place names? Oh yeah, well, yes and no. Oh, no, that's actually a no. Um, we have place names but we haven't keyed them in, in terms of subject matter. But if somebody, it's kind of backwards because I think pretty sure any of your libraries know where they are. So if they just tell us their place, then I think we can go in and search and we can find by, by counts in particular areas. There's a town I think called Egmont, is that correct? E-G-M-O-N-T, am I saying it wrong? Mount Egmont was now Mount Taranaki. Ah. Okay, well, it says Egmont on some of these. It looks like we have about 400 photographs for, from, from Egmont, Egmont or whatever it is now. So I'm just looking at boxes that are sitting. So the best way for us to do that, and listing we have, we can't, we don't have that kind of minutia. So, but it's just a, it's just a query to us. Uh, all I'm gonna ask is there are a whole lot of people on this call. So if you can, um, just be patient, you send the query in. And we, we will get to you, but please just be patient. So what would be, are we sort of coming up to the last 10 minutes, what would be your advice for somebody sitting here who works for a small public library service, who's kind of interested to know what you might hold that would be relevant for their collection? What, what, what sort of three things should they do? First thing is go to your administrator, tell them that you are this, in this charming meeting with this Fairfax situation and that you uh, have some interest in increasing your holdings and you want permission to be able to do that. Because the, the thing that seems to be most complicated is being able to fund these things. So first go to someone and say, we have this opportunity. I don't know how much it's gonna cost yet, but it's gonna cost some money and we wanna do this. Can we pursue this? Because if you pursue this and if they shut you down, then it's, it wastes a lot of time for everybody. Um, so we don't have 100 people running around here. There are three of us. So thing is, that would be the first thing to make sure that your administration can actually have the idea that they want some of the material first. Second, constrain what you want and, and be able to deliver to us an query that's very tight. So. If, they're, if you're in a particular town, you're looking for regional photographs, as, as specific as you can get would be super helpful. Sometimes that unfortunately isn't even enough in the archive, but usually we can land something out of that. If there are other topics, um, for example, 
know that we have the archive split into subjects and personalities. So under zoo, for example, zoo and animals, we have two different sections. One are the people like zookeepers and zoo owners and zoo administration. And the other section are the animals, which would be the subject matter because we don't know their names. And, and um, so basically it's the same thing right across the board. So I think the same thing with museums, for example, we have a museum section that are the people who ran museums historically. And there's a separate section for the actual buildings of the museums, the actual structures of the museums. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of looking around me right now, but so basically that's, I would, th I would say those would be the things and uh, whatever kind of query we can get that and then what we'll be able to do at that point is either if there aren't any photos, we'll tell you. If there are some, we'll tell you. And then we can sort of work out a value with you at that point and something that's reasonable for you. And my goal is to be very reasonable. My real goal is for the first 15, 20 libraries and museums that buy from us there, and we're up to about six or seven now, I think. I want everybody to be really happy. I want everybody to get what they want. And I want them to feel that they got a good value for it. And we're known for that in Australia, there's no way we, that the National Library would have come back to us five times to buy more stuff had, had we done something bad. So that's, that's, our, that's really kind of where we are. It's a couple more minutes. There must be another pithy question. I see 35 chats going on. Holy moly. Anything really nasty? Anything really ups, upsetting to anybody? I'm happy to take it. I'm, I'm OK with that. No? Does anybody else have a question that they would like for us to ask at this point? Anything else you would like to say or anything you want to know more about? And you can email me directly. It will come to me at cc's to my assistant, info at the fairfaxarchives.co.nz. You can also find me in our gallery in Los Angeles. So that's Duncan Miller Gallery. I'm not in the gallery now. I'm in our very cold warehouse. So someone's asking, what is the interest in the Jean Batten photograph currently on the website? Do you know? I mean, how much interest has there been? Yeah. Uh, it looks like uh, looks like the interest is pretty good. I'm, I'm not an auction expert. It's very interesting to see the inside of an auction. So now because we are running our own auction company, we see that. But usually the last two hours are when things start to go crazy. So I think there are some very sophisticated collectors that are bidding on some of this work. And I think they're kind of waiting a bit and to see what's what. If you, like I said to all of you, registering is free and it's easy to do and like that. So if you register on that site, we export that out. So whenever we do updates, email updates on any new uh, collections that we're gonna be presenting, we'll do that. I think we'll probably have a, a, a we have an Instagram like set aside, we haven't done anything with it yet. So I think we'll probably start punching some photos on Instagram that we're dealing with too. Um, and then yeah. uh, just one last question is, have you considered some kind of crowdfunding to care for or otherwise sort out this stuff? I really hate, I mean, I think that's a, I think it's a beautiful notion that you have, but I, I hate the idea of asking people for money like that. Um, I would rather that um, we find which one of you has that rich uncle out that we're all looking for. It's because I know one of you has got that rich uncle and, and all it takes is one rich uncle to figure out their tax issues somehow. And they can you know get some kind of tax credit back for helping us get all of this to the right place. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but we had a couple of people in New Zealand, very high net worth people that, that still want to do some things with us, but. I, I don't know. Look, I'm not a Kiwi. Oh, before I forget, right. I'm coming over there. <laughs> I'm back there if the government will let me in. Um, at the second week of February, I think. Uh, I'll be in Auckland uh, about the 8th and 9th of February. I'll be in Wellington around the 12th or 13th, I think. And I'll be in Christchurch after that at some point. And I'll probably make little informal meetings. So if you guys want to come and you know talk more, hang out, learn what we're doing, that would be fine. I think we'll probably do some more media then too, because 
your media seems to have a fascination with this. So we'll we'll probably do some fun TV. I can't wait to have somebody from, from the government to argue with on TV. So I think that's just going to be great. I mean, maybe your current minister of culture or something. Maybe they're on this call. Yeah, that'd be fun. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not sure if this is a true fact. You're hopeful. I'm not sure if this is a true fact, but Melanie puts in the chat, we only have nine billionaires in New Zealand rich enough. Uncles might be tricky to find. So, yes. <laughs> you don't even need a billionaire. A billionaire is a, a B too many. A multimillionaire, that's probably fine. But, but I mean, look, we're just going to keep doing what we do and trying to get this to the right institutions and, and try to do the right thing. And if any of you think we're doing ahead of ideas about how we can do it better, I boy, I'm sure open for it. I mean, I don't, I'm starting to really understand the difference between Australia and New Zealand now, because we've been in business in Australia for a while doing a lot of this. So it's new to me. So I, I can use all the help that I can get. Our team can use all the help it can get. Uh, we're trying. We're going to make plenty of mistakes, guaranteed, but our goal is to get the right photos to the right places. So, so if we can do that, then, then we have some success. Well, you may have answered that question, but there's just one in here. If there are several institutions competing for photographs, would you favor the New Zealand Australian ones over other countries so that photos are returned to the country of origin? Well, absolutely, not even a question, but here's the thing. No, no other no other museums from other countries have even expressed any interest in this work. So you're you're uh, I mean, no problem about that. They don't even know about this. This is a New Zealand initiative that we have. So we just publicized it in Australia recently. But aside from that, we don't email or send anything outside of either New Zealand or or Australia. And it's one of the reasons we did a dot co dot nz which is kind of annoying. And we also have a, um, I mean, for us, we also have a uh, New Zealand phone number and it's on our website. So you can call that. It call forwards to our LA number, but at least not to spend any money. So if anybody really needs to call us, email is always the best because it comes to our team and we can figure stuff out. But um, yeah, there you go. More? I think that might be just about it. There's some thoughts in the chat about working together and being more effective in this space. So that would be um, interesting to see how that could be progressed. But I think we've come to the end. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending and for your excellent questions. It's a very fascinating and, and uh, story. And um, I was wondering, you know, is there not even any international interest in the pictures of, of, of Princess Diana? That seems quite incredible, but maybe they haven't heard about it yet. Well, she only visited in 1983. <laughs> I discovered so. So uh, from 19 from the 1983 uh, uh, visit that she made, uh, we have a few photos left. I'm sure those are probably at the auction block. But hey, no institutions ask us about any of that stuff yet. So, so mm -hmm. I'd say institutions start yelling at us. Let us know what you, let us know what you want. Let us help you, you figure it out. And yeah, and thank you all for really attending. I'm really. Um, your interest is really hardening. It's just really no, nice to know we've got people out there that care about this so we can help get this all this work to the right place. It's great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so um, Angie's just going to do our closing karakia and um, please uh, be in touch with Daniel via the email that he's given and um, let's see what we can do in this space. Anuia, Anuia, Anuia. Kiti Uru Tapanui, Kia Watia, Kia Mama, Tanako, Titinana, Tiwairua Ete Ara Tangata, Koya Ra Erongo, Fakaria Aki Kirunga, Kia Tina, Tina, Huye, Taikie. Thanks, everybody.